All righty, I am back. Adam and Eve as soulmates. Can you give me some examples right now, Father? I can give you an example that goes to the very core of what you've been going through lately. How would that be? Great. Consider, for instance, the Bible story of Adam and Eve. Here we have a story of the origins of human life on Earth. The story of the original soulmates and original sin. The Bible gives a version that can be taken literally or symbolically. The Atlantean version of creation is similar, but they did not code the true meanings. What do these stories offer us? Understanding of what happened to us and our soulmates. It can help us answer questions like you ask me, "Where's my soulmate?" and "Why are they not with us right now?" The fact is, something is obviously wrong, and we need some answers so we can set it right. In order to understand who our soulmates may or may not be and how to find them, we first need to understand what a soulmate is. And why we now find ourselves separate from our soulmates. The story of Adam and Eve, when looked at in a certain light, can help us understand this. How it hasn't helped me. Be patient. I'm sorry, Father. Please go on. The typical interpretation of the Bible story of Adam and Eve is what, Benial? Well. Basically, it's that Adam was the first human created by God, and then Eve was created from him, because he was lonely. Yes, yes. What else? They lived in paradise and needed nothing. God said they could eat anything except the fruit from one particular tree in the garden. What tree? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. Good. Sounds like a strange tree to have fruit you can eat from, don't you think? I nodded. He looked at me eagerly and said, "Then what?" Then Eve was tempted by a serpent, telling her that if they ate the forbidden fruit, they would be as powerful as God. She subsequently tempted Adam with it. They ate the fruit, hid from God, and were kicked out of paradise. Okay, good enough. The newer ancient teachings say this story was a parable, loosely based on the ancient Atlantean teachings about the first Atlantean soulmate group to lose universal consciousness. The ancient texts basically say that they lost their universal consciousness because of selfishness that led to separating from the One. The Atlantean texts don't conflict with the Bible story. But it does add detail and shed new light on it. The later teachings further say that the story was written in allegory to allegorically represent all of us who fell out of oneness with the universal spirit, not just one couple, not just Adam and Eve. Yes and no. If you remember your history, which I know you do. You'll remember that the ancient Atlantean historical records say that we all started as spiritual beings that were not male or female; we were both, and that we had both male and female parts inside ourselves. At some point, we came upon the earth and beheld the wonders of its physical plane. To exist on this plane, though. We had to change from our angelic spiritual form into a denser physical form. In other words, we needed physical bodies to fully interact with the physical plane. In the process of making this change, we discovered that we divided into male and female parts, and subsequently, along with this change, came self-consciousness and worse, self. Ishness. That is what led to our separation from the universal spirit, i.e., what the Bible calls eating of the forbidden fruit. This was not real fruit, not a real tree. The knowledge of good and evil meant the duality 
of the physical plane rather than oneness. And the biblical original sin was the selfish separation from God which brought us into this duality. The action of eating the forbidden fruit and karmic results, becoming entangled with, caught in and cursed with, the plane of duality, the physical plane on earth, the plane of the knowledge of good and evil. Then the hiding from God was actually the separation and cut off from universal consciousness that we created ourselves. Good. And the being kicked out of Eden was our own subsequent pursuit of selfishness. Very good. But what about the separation of soulmates? What then happens to Adam and Eve to part them? There are several different teachings that involve the story of our manifestation on earth and the separation of soulmates. And, of course, various comparisons can be drawn between all these Atlantean teachings and the Bible story of Adam and Eve. One of the most important things that we need to understand is that losing touch with our soulmates or finding them is not really the primary problem. It is our separation from God and our selfishness that caused the subsequent separation with our soulmates. And dealing with those primary problems must be our primary focus. Or we cannot have a good soulmate relationship or a coming back together in oneness with each other or God. To those ends, we should examine the comparison of the Atlantean teachings with the Bible story. But keep in mind there are two waves of manifestation, and parts apply to both, while other parts only apply to one or the other. He then went on to discuss these teachings. In the comparisons below, the Atlantean teachings will appear in regular type. The associated Bible story will be in bold type. Okay. Number one. We had all the wonder and beauty of the entire universe, which we lived in and enjoyed after creation. Now the Bible story says, Adam and Eve lived in the Bible's Garden of Eden. Number two. We could wander and enjoy the entire universe with no cares, as long as we remained with it all, in our angelic state. And we see in the Bible story that as long as Adam and Eve remained open, receptive, humble, and obedient to the will of the universal spirit, or God, all was in perfect balance, and peace, harmony, and happiness prevailed. And number three, but we had free will. In coming upon the wonders of the unique experience of the earth, we found that we enjoyed the sensations of delving into the polarized material plane. But to do this, we had to lower our vibration and partake of the separateness of manifesting into physical existence we were faced with an option to either just appreciate it but not get attached to it or get fully involved and enmeshed in it. In contemplating their free will choices and realizing we could do other than God's will, we exercised this right selfishly. This resulted in separation from the one and the creation of the world full of selfish people. Now, in the Bible it says, Adam and Eve chose to eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, dichotomy, duality, material, manifestation. 
and in so using their free will to go against the will of God, they separated themselves from God, the One. The original sin, selfishness, was committed, and by the universal law of cause and effect, separation from God ensued. This was the casting out from Eden or Paradise. Thusly, no longer one with God or in harmony with universal will, they accumulated negative karma from selfish behavior that resulted from their separate selfish consciousness, which created a life of suffering and darkness. Losing Touch So as usual, it all comes back to selfishness. And this led to the separation from God and the whole mess. But becoming separated from God was just the beginning. The teachings clearly indicate that the reason why we are not together with our soulmates is because we separated from them via selfishness. It is the end result in a chain of events. It started with self-consciousness, which led to the developing of selfishness and a separation from the universal spirit. Then it went further, and our selfishness led to our ultimate aloneness. No blame. But what about how this has all come to be blamed on Eve, or the feminine aspect? It seems that Adam was as much at fault if not more so. Very insightful. I'm proud of you. Eve has been blamed for the fall and for all the problems humankind has had since, along with the tempting serpent. This is partly due to the way some religions have presented the story of Adam and Eve and the way various social orders chose to see it. This created a scourge on women throughout the ages. But women should not be singled out for blame, like you said. Even in the orthodox biblical way of interpreting the story, it never would have been such a problem if Adam had not partaken of this fruit, regardless of whether Eve did or not. But did Adam have any more of a chance to resist temptation than Eve? Yes and no. It's not nearly as simple as it all seems. What do you mean? It doesn't seem all that simple to me, as it is. Father laughed and smiled at me like a parent who was lovingly amused at the innocent, ignorant remarks of his five-year-old child. I mean, that a realization of the nature of our true beings totally changes the perceptual meaning of the story. The better you understand what was said earlier that our true form is both male and female soulmates who are really just aspects of a singular being, the better will your perception reveal to you the truth of the story. Again, our angelic nature was a sexual polarity integrated being, both male and female elements within one angel. That's why angels are sometimes perceived as sexless, or neutral sexually. It's not because they are sexless, but because they are balanced. They contain both sexes in one being, in harmony. See? I'm stunned. What a realization. I've never even considered it quite that way before. But these elements weren't even considered male and female, as they would be now, until way after our degeneration. Now you're losing me again. I'm afraid I'm having a hard time getting a good grip on that one, Father. To grasp the polarities of our human condition is difficult without universal consciousness. Let me think. Perhaps the best way that we can understand it with our limited brains and limited viewpoint is to try and understand it using several scientific analogies from the ancient teachings. Oh, good. My limited brain should have a much easier time with scientific analogies from the ancient teachings. 
It won't be that difficult. I'm actually trying to make it simpler for you to understand, so don't block up your brain with fears of contemplations and complications that don't exist. I'm sorry again, Father. Maybe I should just keep my mouth shut. Sure. I'm certain that'll be simple for you. I'd like to see you accomplish that for a day, sometimes. I can, I just... Oh, sorry. Please go on. I'll try not to interrupt again. Never try anything. Either do it or don't. I put my hand over my mouth. Before we go on with Zayin's examples, let me interject this little pre-concept. Now, keep in mind that the terms positive and negative, which are used in the examples you're about to read, are meant in the sense of the nature of polar opposites, such as those found with electrical charges in the ends of a battery. He isn't using the term to mean good or bad, as in having a positive or negative attitude. While we do use the terms in that way elsewhere in the book, it is an entirely different meaning that we are using in the following examples. Still, with my hand over my mouth, I nodded to Father to indicate I would be quiet and let him continue with his discussion. He raised an eyebrow over the ridiculousness of my putting my hand over my mouth, and then he went on. First, let's draw a comparison between electricity and the male-female polarities within us. People often think of electricity as positive and negative charges, but actually it's just one energy, and it flows through something as one electrical flow moving in one direction in a circle. It is only when you divide this flow by separating this flow, this circuit, separating the oneness of the flow somewhere, that you get the polarities, the polar opposite terminals of plus and minus. When severed, it is called positive on the side where electrons would be outflowing, and negative on the other side where there is a receptive or vacuum condition, an absence of electrons and a conditioning of wanting to accept electrons. When the circuit is intact, the flow is one circle moving from the direction of what would be positive terminal if it were cut to the direction of what would be the negative terminal if it were cut. But what does that have to do with soulmates? (laughs) Sorry. Okay, let's try something else. Perhaps one of the best ways to understand our natures is by contemplating stars and atoms and understanding them better. Look around you. Everything you see is an illusion of sorts, created by atoms grouped together in certain ways and vibrating at different speeds. Look outside the planet, and you find vast, infinite space sprinkled with stars and planets. Stars and planets are virtually the same as atoms, but on a different scale. Atoms and star systems are all there really is in the entire universe. And if we observe them, we find they actually both act in virtually the same manner. They have the same pattern of existence. It is a pure pattern of a radiating energy, receiving energy, male-female attraction, attachment, and dependence. And every element of a star system or atom plays all these various roles. It is a pattern of a way of life that fits into everything else in the universe 
harmoniously. Both follow some perfect marching orders that the universe has come up with for life in harmony with all other life. Both function on positive and negative polarities, attracting and engaging with each other. Male and female elements in a perfect perpetual dance. In that sense, it could be said that the entire universal order is based on sex. The workings of the atom and of solar systems are just like our essential beingness, our true nature. It is what we really are. Our true natures can thus be likened to the elements of an atom, electrons which are negatively charged. Receptive female principles are attracted to, and in the orbit of, the nucleus which has positive charge, outflowing male principle of an atom. It is the same with the planet or planets, female, that are in orbit of a star, male, in one solar system. It is not by accident that we call the planet we live on Mother Earth. If the Earth is the mother of life here, who is the father? The sun. Life would not exist without the interaction, the intercourse of the energies of either. A solar system is not really a bunch of planets and a star. It is the one whole being the male and female elements, stars, planets, as soulmates within this one being. But they don't have relationships like soulmates, like humans, don't they? Even though you don't see the sun and planets touching each other, they are indeed touching and in constant contact with each other. There's also constant interplay or intercourse of many energies. You don't just perceive it with your limited senses, although human scientists can pick up some of them with their scientific sensors. Yet they generally ignore things that aren't physical. What energies? Take gravity for just one thing. Ask a scientist why the planets are orbiting the sun. Gravity. But just what is gravity? What does that really mean? Scientists don't really understand what gravity is. Could it actually involve outflowing love and attraction? Are you saying that's what it is? Just think about it and put your hand over your mouth again. At least you look like you're listening better that way. Give and take. Give and take. In my much earlier days at the monastery, I asked some other fundamental questions, and Zayin explained the infinite link of all things in the universe, and the concepts of equality and superiority. Father, I know I'm young, but I've studied and traveled a great deal. In many, many cultures and religion, men dominate. Do they now? My, you must have studied and traveled a great deal, he said in a pleasantly sarcastic way. My ego wasn't really getting it at the time, of course, so I just went on. All these men and women are taught by their culture and religion that the men are superior to women. And in most cultures, there are classes and some serve and some rule. But here at the monastery, it seems mixed. I see both. Yet there's an equality also. There's no feeling of superiority or self-centeredness in the adept true teachers. Yet they are served. You cannot compare the inequality and barbaric mindset of such cultures and religions to what we are, do, and manifest here. That is why it's confusing to you. It is simply universal order. 
nothing more. Everything is both guider to something and guided by something, subordinate to something, and superior to something. There is always someone better than you and lesser than you, including with me. This is how the universe runs, how all things link via their polarity. It is just polarity, not superiority or inferiority. Each individual's duty is to find what they are attracted to, supposed to surrender to and be subordinate to. That's what each of us are personally responsible for not forgetting someone to be subordinate to us. Then, once you find your proper place, our proper subordination in the great scheme of things, then whatever is meant to do that with us in the infinite link of the universe will do it of its own accord. I am subordinate ultimately only to the universal spirit. In my place and relationship here at the monastery, I am subordinate to Mikhail, but that is superseded by my subordination to the universal spirit. You chose to be subordinate to me as a student, but some day you will only be subordinate to and serving God. As the Grand Master said, He who would be the greatest would be the servant to all. I am not served or treated with respect because I desire it to be. I just am. I just serve. I just focus on my surrender and humility to God. And in the security and fulfillment of that relationship, I have all that I need. I am free to love and give to all of you. If you wish to learn humility and take such a stance with me, you need to have an attitude of respect and humility. But only because that's what you want from me and thus need to do. But that is your prerogative and you make it your place if you choose to. I don't make it your place. I understand. That makes sense. Good. Then see if this makes even more sense to you. The stars, planets, electrons, nuclei, men and women, all contain both the female and male elements and should play both roles in the proper order. A planet plays an outflowing male role to its moons, which are attracted to and one with the planet. A star, such as our sun, plays an outflowing male role to the planets in this solar system, which, in their attraction to the sun, become one with the sun and receptive to its energy. But a star, such as our sun, is also attracted to, and one with, the receptive female principle to something else, such as the black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, which our sun orbits. So it plays both roles. This is the way of things in the universe, all things. Only humans resist and go against the flow. They all want to be God only, the center only, served only. And none want to be humble and serve and give. Some do. Yes, all too few. So it has to do with attraction? This is just one way to look at these universal give-and-take links. There's certainly the attracted to viewpoint, i.e., the moon is attracted to the and orbits the planets, and the planets are attracted to and orbit the stars. 
the stars are attracted to and orbit galactic centers, and galactic centers are attracted to... But again, there's the flip side. You can also see it from the outflowing viewpoint rather than the attracted to viewpoint. The planets flow energy to the moons. The suns flow energy to the planets. The black holes flow energy to the suns, contrary to what some scientists think. And something is flowing energy to the black hole. And something is flowing energy to that and that etc. And people? On the human level, the polarities we split, i.e. men and women, reflect these principles in different ways when we're separated in consciousness. And on the earth plane, men and women, once, one, are very different when separated into their polarities. And the lower the person's consciousness the greater the difference will be, and the greater the lack of harmony. Again, each one of us has within us both the male and female, both the receptive and the outflowing qualities, totally equal, yet in different positions. We all are supposed to be receptive to something and outflowing to something else. But men and women are so different, and some tend to be dominating and some submissive. And in all cases, it always seems to turn into a nightmare and a big mess. What are we supposed to do in this state? It's not a question of what we're supposed to be, so much as what happened to us and why we are, and what we've become, and what we will make of things. Yes, the differences can vary widely, but there are certain qualities that are generally associated with men and women as generalities only. A few of the qualities that are associated with the female negatively charged, receptive side, are emotional sensitivity, passivity, mutability, adaptability, and being more intuitively oriented than logically based. Qualities that generally are contributed to the male or outflowing side are emotional insensitivity, suppression, aggressiveness, being dominating, being more fixed, and logically oriented rather than intuitively based. So, We are stuck with these limited ranges as long as we are male and female? No. As males and females grow in consciousness, they thus get closer to becoming one again, and all the stereotypical male and female qualities begin to merge until you are completely a balanced being. Thus, a higher consciousness male will have more emotional sensitivity, intuitive ability, etc., and a higher consciousness female will also have more dynamic capabilities and logic, etc. Wow, thank you, Father. That last statement really made things click. I'm glad you have clicked, son. Back to the fall. Later that year, after I digested some of the earlier concepts and had some realizations, we had another discussion about the whole Adam and Eve soulmate split concept. Father, I understand much of what we previously discussed about the Adam and Eve fall, allegory now, in a new light. But would you explain more about the idea of Eve being the first to be tempted? When we are functioning as whole angelic beings, the one being female's elements are on the parameter, our outside, so to speak, and the male elements on the inside, just like planets are on the outside or perimeter areas of a solar system, or electrons outside the nucleus of an atom. That's why Eve went first, so to speak. So use the solar system 
as an example again. Because the female element is on the outside, it is the first to make contact with other things outside the system. For example, our solar system travels through space as a one whole thing, one being, which it is. Now, if we were to come upon a solar system eating monster, who would get eaten first? The planet that was the farthest out from the center. The planet that was on the outside, most periphery. And these are female elements of the one solar system being. Thus, when we came upon the trap of our material plane, the outermost parts of our being, the female elements of our one angelic whole being, were affected first, and were the first to separate off from us as a whole, the Eve principle. Then, later, the center, or the male element of our being, got exposed to, and also drawn into, separation. Adam, seemingly, followed Eve's lead. But remember, we were one being. It was us as a whole angelic being who fell into separation, not women only. It is not women that cause men to fall. It was just the element of us to experience the temptations of the new plane, and the first part of us to separate and become lost. Adam, the first to return. So, the female element broke away first. Does that mean that they must also be the first to return to the male element in order for their reuniting of soulmates to take place? Not at all, Peniel. As you learned long ago, the ancient manuscripts reveal that the Adam referred to in the Bible was actually an Atlantean. And not just any Atlantean. This was the same entity who in one of his later Atlantean incarnations, was Master Tot, the Grand Master of the Children of the Law of One. This was also the same entity who was later known as many others, including Jesus. The meaning of this is staggering. Not only was he the first human male being of the second wave, to separate from the universal spirit, he was also the first to return to oneness. And because he was the first to return to oneness, he was of the highest consciousness. This also made him the best guide to others trying to achieve what he already achieved. That's why he's considered our grand master. It's not just some title or position he was appointed to, and because consciousness continues to grow and expand, and he was the first to return to universal consciousness, he's always a step ahead of us, and thus always of the highest consciousness. He was thus the guide of the children, their spiritual leader, if you will. From even beyond the days of Atlantis, then on, throughout many of his incarnations and beyond. We continue to walk in his footsteps when we leave this plane. That is incredible, but it doesn't quite answer my question. Let me finish. You have the idea backwards. If the female element must rejoin the male first, and the female has achieved higher consciousness or enlightenment, which they would need to if they were seeking to rejoin with their soulmate, what would they be rejoining to? A normal, selfish man? How could that work? It's the opposite, and that is why I was telling you about Master Tot. When he returned to oneness, he rejoined his connection, his link to God, and in doing so, and becoming thus enlightened, he made it possible for his higher conscious female soulmates to join him in this return also. Otherwise, if he was still separate, still lost, still selfish, 
they would have had to bypass them if they chose to return to oneness. And that's a very important point. And how we make it possible is where the story of Adam and Eve intersects with and becomes quite relevant to the spiritual path. How's that? Remember that Eve, because of the receptive and outer nature of the female element within us, was the first element to separate from oneness and fall into darkness? The Adam element followed, and getting kicked out of paradise was not far behind. This was, in a sense, the creation of the first path. It was the path taken by leaving oneness. From then on, a way back to oneness with the universal spirit had existed, and being awaiting our recognition and return, the path of unselfish love. In the right order, polarities vanish to become one flow. As was said earlier, Everything in the entire universe orbits something else. Electrons orbit nuclei. Moons orbit the planets. Planets orbit the stars. Stars orbit black holes. Black holes orbit... This process, just as in an atom, requires polarity. Requires having opposite sexes requires the receptive qualities and outflowing qualities. And this is where male and female come in. But in order for everything to function as one harmonious thing, it also requires all the polarities to be in the right order. This is because the flow of the circle of universal energy moves in only one direction. Zayin explained it to me using the idea of the star exercise, which is very much like a basic electric circuit. The star exercise reflects this great principle, this great universal pattern. What it is we do when we do the star exercise alone, Peniel. We take in universal life energy through our breathing, and through our left hand, which we visualize as receptive. Receptive, like a female principle, yes? Yes? Go on. Then the energy passes through us, and we send it out through the right hand. Again, we control the flow of this energy with our visualization. So we visualize it going out the right hand, and the energy follows our thought, yes? But when done with a circle of people, linking together by holding hands, the energy flows in a circle, going in a direction dictated by the fact that the left hand is receptive and the right hand is outflowing. If one person is not receptive on the left, the flow stops for all. But when everyone is submissive and receptive in their proper place and outflowing in their proper place, all becomes one, is one. There is no inequality, no beginning or end of the flow in the circle. It no longer comes from the positive pole and goes to the negative pole, it is always just flowing. It just is. As in consciousness and life, there is always someone below you and someone above you. But it doesn't matter. The chain is one. The flow is one. And when you plug into it, all are simply the one. This is the way of the universe and the way of soulmates who have achieved the consciousness. Putting the batteries in the wrong way. So the fall was like letting go of each other's hands, turning around in different directions towards each other, wandering off 
etc. Very much so. When we manifested on earth, and eventually separated into male and female parts, selfishness set in. The great circle was broken. And it was, as you just said, all this jumbled up our polarities badly, and our ability to be receptive in our proper place, and outflowing in our proper place, just as if some were trying to do the star exercise facing one direction, and some were trying to do it facing the other direction, and none were making the great circle. It's a big polarity mess. So, Father, is this polarity mix-up and separation also why men chase after women, instead of chasing God as they should be? Yes. When we, our soulmate group, were just one being, our polarities were in order, and harmony reigned within us, and with our connection to God. But our male and female parts reversed polarity when we separated from the one. That's because our separation was the result of turning away from being receptive, female principle, to the universal spirit, and submissive to universal will. We turned away 180 degrees, totally opposite of the way we need to be, for us to be in our proper order. Then the male and female parts separated within each of the beings that had separated from the one. The female and male elements also essentially turned 180 degrees from each other in order for separation to occur. You can see this in magnets. If you turn them one way, they attract and join together physically and with their energy fields. But if you turn them 180 degrees in the other direction, they repel and separate. So what male and female elements are truly supposed to be in spiritual or angelic state get scrambled in the human state. And the normal polarities of male and female sort of reversed. You can't be truly in either the receptive female or outflowing male polarity. If you're cut off from the universal flow, both men and women are lost if they're not one with the universal spirit. Thus, men are insecure and confused about what they're supposed to really be. They're confused about both their masculine and their feminine receptive side. Many block their feminine side by generating hostile thoughts about homosexuality. But their feminine side doesn't really have to do with homosexuality. It has to do with internal balance and being receptive to God. Their receptive side is the very thing that gives them the ability to be attached to, to be a wife to the universal spirit, which then allows them to be a true father and giver to everyone else. In our lost and selfish state of present existence, men desire to attach themselves to women rather than to the universal spirit. And in the women's confused and lost state, many women try to get men to be attached to them and get men to do what they want them to do, rather than urging the man to seek the universal spirit and follow universal will. Then when some women finally get attached to them, and get men to do what they want, what do they do? They don't like the men anymore because they're weak. Yes, they get repulsed. They end up having no respect for the men they can control, even after they, after they tried so hard to control them. They ultimately feel that the men they control are somewhat loathsome and repellent. And then they begin to nag, and be what they call a bitch to the men, etc., of course they do. This is only natural. She's virtually driven by nature to ma to nag a weak man. The man is selfish, needy of her. The woman senses the man is all wrong. This is how it goes when men are not right with themselves and the universal spirit. But they still do it. They still have relationships. Sure, but like what? 
Many women have decided that men are either little boys and want a woman to be like a mother to them, or they decided that men are brutal and abusive or just jerks. And it's all true, depending on the course the man's taken. Some women have given up on finding a decent man. Some settle for a man because they think they can find no no one any better, or no one perfect. Some have turned to their own sex. But what most women think men are is not what they really are. At least, it's not what they're meant to be. An average normal man is polarity reversed. They suck energy rather than giving it. A real man is one with the universal spirit and radiates. And while they still have the masculine qualities, they have a very different nature than what most women have come to expect. A real man, a spiritual man, is in control of his self, and his strength is not macho force, but rather it's the strength of the universal spirit. That permeates him and flows through him from deep inside. He does not dominate women, and his environment by force and selfishness. He radiates the light of God within him, and that automatically influences his environment with the strongest force there is: unselfish love. Are you saying it's all men's fault? No, why do you have to go to such extreme polarities? It either has to be men's fault or women's fault to you. No, father, it's just I guess I don't have a full understanding yet, and the last things you said led me to believe that men were at fault. The things I said did not lead you to believe that. You led yourself to believe that. That's true. I'm sorry. I did an affirmation to myself. I am always humble. Men certainly need to get it together, get back to God first. But women aren't totally blameless here. If a woman really wants to change and find the right kind of man. There are men out there who are one with the universal spirit, or at least dedicated to achieving that. Granted, they are very few, but a higher consciousness woman, who asks the universal spirit for guidance in this, will find what they're looking for. But many women would rather attach themselves to a man who isn't attached to the universal spirit. Because the woman doesn't want to be receptive to the universal spirit either, because she is selfish and wants to remain that way, and they know they have to go through the same changes as the male, which means the death of the selfish separate self. A woman who wants an unselfishly loving man. Must eventually become unselfishly loving, also, and just as with men, not that many women are willing to do what is necessary to achieve that either. As you know, many men chase after women, and many women like and support that behavior, and they're just as much to blame for all the problems as long as they take such an attitude. So we live in a world full of polarity mix-up, selfish men and women. Of course, it all makes for one big mess. It cannot work. This is all out of polar balance and causes all kinds of relationship problems. Can you imagine the chaos in the universe if the stars and planets behave this way? Can you imagine what would happen if the planets tried to lure the sun, and the sun broke out of its orbit and began chasing after other planets? It would cause a chain reaction of disaster and chaos all over the universe. The polarities must take their proper place, or discord will never end. Problems with partners 
of different consciousness levels. All righty. I think I'm going to end there. Uh, this is page 318 of 377. I might get it finished next week, but I'm not sure. Anyway, I thank you all for listening, and I hope that you're enjoying it. I'll see you all later. Bye now.